Hello, and welcome to IMR's Masonry Education Webinar Series. We're very pleased to be joined today by our friends at the National Building Museum to hear about their upcoming exhibition titled Justice is Beauty, the work of Mass Design Group from Architecture to Practice. IMI and the National Union of Bricklayers and Allied Craft Workers have been proud supporters of the museum since its creation 40 years ago. The museum plays a vital role, not only in preserving our country's building heritage, but in creating dialogue about the future of the built environment and the role it plays in our society. With that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Brent Glass, Interim Director of the National Building Museum, to tell a little bit more about today's program. Dr. Glass is a national leader in the preservation, interpretation, and promotion of history. He is a public historian who today provides management and consulting services to the museum. Historical organizations and cultural institutions throughout the United States and other countries. Previously, Dr. Glass serves as the director of the National Museum of American History from 2002 through 2011. Welcome, Dr. Glass. Thank you and welcome everyone to uh, this uh, seminar today, which is going to be outstanding. And I'm really pleased to welcome all of you to thank the International Masonry Institute, uh, to also recognize the Mass Design Group, and you're gonna learn more about their wonderful uh, work. And we're going to be featuring uh, their work at the museum uh, next year when we reopen the museum. Um, as, as it has been noted, this is the museum's 40th anniversary. Last week, uh, we celebrated our, our anniversary on December 12th, 1980. President uh, Jimmy Carter signed the legislation that created uh, the National Building Museum. And the museum is still the only museum in the country that is dedicated to uh, inspiring curiosity and, and knowledge about the built environment. It's a unique mission, and we have been very pr privileged to offer exhibitions and programs to millions of people since we um, opened in 1940, and we can and we plan in 1980, excuse me, and we plan to continue uh, that mission uh, in into the future. Um, the the museum is housed in the historic pension building, which was completed in the 1880s and. Uh, um, originally was, uh, housed the, the Pension Bureau, which uh, served the Union uh, veterans and their families. It was a memorial to the Civil War and also uh, a place of uh, many special events, which were held in the, in the Great Hall of the museum. I think of particular note, uh, this, the, the pension building has 15.5 million bricks. And for this organization, I think that's a significant number. Uh, I bet all of you wish you had that contract. Uh, to do um, the, the pension building back in the 1880s. There's a good, a good image of it. Um, while you have that pleasant thought in your mind, I hope you also think uh, favorably about the, uh, the National Building Museum and, uh, and become a member of the museum. We, we could use you, your membership, uh, your support, especially at this end of the year. Uh, think about giving a, a gift to, uh, membership to a family member or friends. Uh, also, if, if you're not a member, please join us, uh, or if you're already a member, thank you. And uh, please also um, consider uh, shopping at our museum shop uh, online or in person. Uh, we have uh, special discounts uh, that uh, we're all offering uh, people attending this, uh, this seminar, and um, you can find out more about it uh, on our website. So with that, I want to introduce um, uh, Kathy Frankel, who is the Vice President for Exhibitions and Collections at the museum, and also Susan Piedmont Palladino, who is the Director at Virginia Tech of the Washington Alexander Architecture Center. Thank you and enjoy the seminar. Thank you so much, Brent. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Kathy Frankel. I am the head of the exhibitions department at the Building Museum and have had that pleasure for 20 years now, so have a long history with IMI including an exhibition we partnered with IMI on um, called Masonry Variations back in 2003. Still one of my very favorites. Uh, but we're thrilled to be invited to participate in today's lunchtime seminar series. Um, and the timing couldn't have been better 
as we are in the throes of finishing an exhibition on the work of Mass Design Group in preparation for our reopening early next year. And as you'll discover in today's, as today's conversation progresses, we saw how nicely the work of Mass aligns with the goals and the spirit of IMI. Um, but first, how did we come to present an exhibition on the work of Mass? Uh, about three years ago, we were hearing more and more about the work, their work, and when the Memorial for Peace and Justice down in Alabama opened up um, to much deserved fanfare, a few of us museum staff, including me, had to see it for ourselves. We were so inspired by what we saw that we cold called Michael Murphy, the co-founder of Mass, to see if he'd be interested in talking to us about an exhibition. And frankly, to our surprise, he answered the phone when we called him on the first try um, and immediately said that he was in. So we spent the last couple of years developing this exhibition. Um, there are many sort of through lines to the exhibition that Susan Piedmont Palladino, our cur longtime curator, can talk a little bit more about. Um, but one of them that really I found intriguing and um, is especially timely right now is the focus on health and healing. Um, and so that's a really interesting thread we'll see through that. And, and who would have known how timely that conversation would be in the light of this pandemic? and the reignited fight for racial justice following the murder of George Floyd. Um, so we look forward to welcoming you back to the museum next year. The exhibition will remain on view for about another year, so you'll have plenty of time to make the trip safely. Um, also, keep a look out on our website because we will continue to do programming about this exhibition, um, virtual programming in the near future. Um, so we hope you will join us for that. So from here, I'll pass it over to you, Susan. Um, to talk a little bit more about the exhibition and then launch into the conversation from our generous friends from Mass who are staying late at work tonight in Africa to have this conversation. Thanks, Kathy. That's great. And with IMI, it's fun to remember that one of the first exhibitions I actually really worked on at the Building Museum was Masonry Variations. I had gotten involved in the Big and Green exhibition. And uh, my career as an architect and an educator uh, really intersected with the building museum then, and it's it's been a wonderful relationship ever since where I've gotten to um, cross those paths and get students involved at the building museum. And then also with the mass design exhibition, um, I was excited when the museum decided to take this on and a little bit uh, envious that I wasn't involved at the beginning, but now I am because uh, a few years, I think, before the memorial in Alabama was built, Michael Murphy gave a talk at Virginia Tech, and I went down, and I was not that familiar with Michael or Mass's work, and I sat in the middle of this auditorium that was packed, and I listened to him basically challenge all of us, a room full of architects and landscape architects and industrial designers, um, to think about what more architecture can do, and it was Fantastic, I've never forgotten it, one of the best lectures I've ever heard, so I'm thrilled to be part of this. And as Kathy said, the, the sort of um, pointing out that equity and justice and health are more important than ever to address in the built environment. So I am pleased to welcome today for our conversation from Kigali, where it is a little after seven o'clock. Those of you who regularly Google time zone changes, uh, probably know that already. And we're happy to have Emily Goldenberg and Theo Uwaiyazu. I've had it practiced before, Uwaiyazu. Um, and uh, Emily is a graduate of Roger Williams University. She's an architect uh, and she is the design director at Mass's office in Kigali, Rwanda. Emily's been with Mass since 2016 and previously worked with Sasaki Associates. Theo received his architecture degree from the University of Rwanda and joined Mass in 2014 as a Global Health Corps Design Fellow, and he's now an associate with the firm. And he was part of the African Design Center Fellows uh, Design Build Project at the Ruhehe Primary School, and is a member of the Mass Build Team, which is one of the topics we're gonna to be talking about today. And before we dive into a discussion, uh, I want to hand this off to Emily, uh, she's going to give us a little bit of background and show a few images um, so that you'll have fresh in your mind some of the projects that we're going to be talking about uh, today at uh, this event. Emily? Thank you, everyone, and Susan, and 
uh, for the great introduction. We're really honored to be here today for this conversation and this discussion and um, to, you know, be partners with you all on the building exhibition and to be able to speak with you further about our work across the globe. Um, and so hopefully you can all see my screen and, and I'll just do a very brief introduction about mass design, who we are in our work, so that can be, give a bit of a precursor to the discussion that we're about to have together as a group uh, focused really around uh, our craft and uh, beyond the building, which we'll talk a lot about a little bit further. Um, and so we at Matt's Design Group are a mission-driven design collective that started really by this mission statement that we believe design is never neutral, it either hurts or heals. And as an organization, our mission is to research, build, and advocate for architecture and design that promotes justice and human dignity. And through that, we really work with organizations to amplify their missions and to better understand their needs so that we can collectively work towards a larger impact for their organization as our partners. A little bit about our history um, and where that statement came from. Uh, in our beginning as, as an organization, we had this incredible opportunity to work with two thought leaders in global health care delivery, Dr. Agnes Waho and Dr. Paul Farmer. Um, Dr. Agnes was then the Minister of Health in Rwanda and was tasked to continue rebuilding the nation's healthcare system following the 1994 genocide against the Tutsis. And Dr. Paul Farmer is really this longtime global health activist, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you may be familiar with his name. Um, and together, we, there, he, you know, founded the Partners in Health organization, which is work is really focused on delivering dignified health care to the poorest around the world. Um, and so for them, this uh, partnership and this relationship really started with conversations with Dr. Paul Farmer about how we can better serve those communities um, in, in certain areas of the world. And so that conversation really read, led to our where Mass Design Group was really born in Rwanda, we like to say, and this is where a lot of our team is based still today. Um, it is, I'm sure most of you are familiar, but we like to share this just in case. It is an incredible, uh, remarkable country in the central eastern Africa. Um, and Partners in Health and the Ministry of Health had partnered to build a district hospital in that northern region in the Barrera district. Um, and so this di district was among the last few ones uh, without a district hospital at that time. This area is incredibly beautiful. If you haven't been to Rwanda, it is the land of a thousand hills. It sits at the bottom of uh, some of the world's most beautiful parks, the Volcanoes National Park, and is this border between Rwanda, the DRC, and Uganda. Um, and at that time in 2006, Butaro, which is, was a district of about 400,000 uh, people, um, and it's one of the most impoverished, it was one of the most impoverished districts of the country. And so Butaro District Hospital was seen as this opportunity to take a closer look at the healthcare delivery systems in those rural settings and in the global south in general. Um, and so the design of the Butara District Hospital was really the beginning of our um, process as an organization, the beginning of, of MASS. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about uh, the process and, and the crafts that we learned through, through this first project, but it was really focused on challenging the way that we can design to heal. Um, this idea that our buildings are hurting us, um, and they're making us sicker. And so how can we reimagine health design in a way that we are able to dignify the experience for our partners, for the end users, um, create better, better ventilation? And this is, of course, a really um, prominent issue at the moment with the current global pandemic and design in, to ensure that there's natural ventilation and that buildings will make us healthier. Um, and so this is just an aerial view of the hospital where we're showing this idea of this connection to the beautiful surrounding landscape and how we can design to ensure that these spaces are dignified for all of the clients. A little bit about um, who we are, we mentioned this a little bit briefly, but we again partner with a number of mission driven organizations. We work with public and private partnerships um, from our first part, uh, project with Partners in Health 
to other institutions like the African Leadership University here in Rwanda and the University of Rwanda. This is just an example of the places or the current um, locations that we work. We have um, offices in Kigali, we have offices in the US in Boston um, and Poughkeepsie and Santa Fe. Um, and we are continuing to grow as a team and also to work globally across uh, the world. So you can see here an example of some of the places that we work as an organization spread throughout the continent of Africa, but also spreading uh, throughout the globe. We are a design collective. We're made up of a diverse group of people and skill sets. Um, it really ranges from where we started as designers and architects. Um, we have a really strong landscape design team, which is really integral to how we think in a holistic design process. We are furniture and product designers. We also have a large engineering team from mechanical and electrical to geotechnical design and structural. Um, a narrative team, our full operations team, of course, who really support the work that we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and a series of business development fellows and fellows who've also joined over the years throughout various partnerships with organizations and grants. This is just a small collection of some of the work that we've done in the past, and this is a little bit heavy, heavily weighted towards uh, Af the African continent at the moment, and, the, and where Teo and I really are focused in doing a lot of our work. But as a collective, and with all of the skill sets mentioned above, we really have this ability to work at various scales. Um, and so we've, we are now above over 10 years of delivering significant projects in Rwanda, and this kind of shows where we started with the Butara District Hospital in 2008 to how we've grown as an organization. And with this ability to bring disciplines in-house to ensure that the project delivery is focused on the mission of the organization and project goals. And so I think really excited about where we have been heading over the past few years based on where we started and continuing to, to grow as a team. And how we work, we wanted to just touch on this a little bit because um, you know, I think it is a little bit unique from other typical architecture firms. Our project involvement really varies from the traditional architecture business model where you, you essentially have um, the architect coming in during design and construction, um, and typically the client develops the beginning visioning and planning of a project and, and then brings an architect or a planner on board after that vision is developed. We really believe in an involvement model that spans all phases of a project and achieves the greatest value add to our partners from the very beginning. And so to us, you know, the, it's much more successful to come in at the beginning so that we can help our partners understand and define what a capital project campaign can really look like and start to unpack the different steps that are involved in that process, but also that we can work together as a team to develop a vision or a mission for a uh, specific project or the partner based on their organization's needs. And so that spans all the way through planning and design and construction to the end of evaluation, which is also an incredibly important part of the process, which ensures that we can circle back to all of the um, impacts or the vision that we had agreed together on at the very beginning of a project and actually measure those impacts and make sure that, that we are achieving those. And if not, how can we adjust and, and ensure that those impacts are um, embedded into the project? Um, over the past 10 years, we've been doing projects at this scale and have developed a way of working that's really applied across all of those projects. And so we really call this our systems thinking process or design process where, you know, from the very beginning for us, the mission is an incredibly important part of this process. This idea that each project must achieve a simple, legible and transmissible idea that we believe in immersing, immersing ourselves in the context. So if we don't ask the right questions during those visioning and planning phases um, or build consensus with the partners or end users, we may actually fail the very people we're seeking to serve. This idea about proof of impact, the question is not if, but in what way and, and how much impact a project can really have and, and challenging those assumptions to really get to um, the greater goals for projects. Investing upstream, which is really about how, who specifically benefits from 
the design services and at what cost. So this idea of being able to work with our partners earlier on in the process to develop a vision and then be able to unlock capital and fundraise with our partners so that we can ensure that um, the project is as successful as it can be. And then the fifth is um, Justice is Beauty. Um, a part of the title for this conversation, really this idea that everyone has this fundamental right to a built and natural world that is beautiful and one that improves our quality of life. Um, and so through that process, we aim to really create this shared understanding of needs and goals. And we do this by asking a series of questions through the process with our partners to understand what more our project can do. And just an example of how, how we um, work as an organization and uh, use that mission and systems thinking process for every single project. Um, and I'll just end it here. I think just wanted to give that brief introduction and um, open it up for the discussion. Great, thank you. Thank you, Emily. It's always, whenever I, your presentation about mass, I always think there's so much to talk about. How are we actually going to focus ourselves? But today, uh, what we want to talk about mostly is um, is really this how question: uh, how the how the buildings get built and construction, and really how is this focus on the dignity and the development of the people who build these projects? Um, Michael famously asks, "What more can architecture do?" And so this is, in a sense, part of the answer to the question. Um, one of my favorite stories that's in the exhibition and also in the wonderful uh, book uh, of the same title, uh, Justice is Beauty, is the story of Anne Marie. I'm not going to try to pronounce her last name. I would embarrass myself. But it's a story about a woman who became a mason, a local craft worker working with local materials. And not only is there a fascinating story about um, running against conventions about what's expected of different genders, but that she apprenticed on, I think, the Butaro District Hospital and now has become someone who trains other Masons. And this focus on local, on developing local uh, talent and local workers and local materials, this whole idea of local fabrication, which I think is a term, you guys use this term, low fab. And so I wonder if you want to talk a little bit about um, where that term comes from uh, and what's the project where you first use that term. Uh, Emily or Teo, either one of you can can take that one. Um, yeah, the, the local fabrication of low fab is a philosophy we, we, we developed after um, uh, learning and working uh, on construction sites and realizing that there's a, there's a, we, we wanted to challenge and invite people to think the uh, construction process as uh, uh, itself uh, having a, a potential for impact. Um, how much can you do with the uh, low local fabrication uh, through uh, different principles? We have like four principles, which are hiring locally and uh, sourcing regionally. That uh, talks about um, uh, investing in the local economy and training where you can. Like, can you leave some skills uh, on the ground? And then, uh, most importantly, it's about taking the uh, design decisions uh, to invest in the dignity of the communities we work with. Uh, that's basically, in, uh, in brief, um, what local fabrication is to us. No fab. And Theo, Theo, I also want to, you were part of uh, the African Design Center Fellows program, I guess, part of that. And that's a fascinating story by itself. And this, the fellows of that program, part of their uh, task to complete the program was to do a design build project, if I understand correctly. And it was this Ruhehe Primary School. I wonder if you could talk yes. a little bit about that project and your role in that. And what is the African Design Center uh, Fellows Program? And how is that part of this cultivation of uh, local skills and competencies? So yeah, uh, the African Design Center is uh, an apprenticeship program that MAS started uh, three years ago. Uh, the aim of the program was to um, to, to train young uh, African architects from different countries. So the first cohort had uh, 
10, 10 students, uh, graduate students from architecture schools from eight countries uh, who came together and to challenge the issues and challenges that um, uh, the region of Africa is facing with regard to design or uh, um, a build environment. So the, the students, uh, part of the program was to design uh, a project and ex execute it. Uh, as Emily mentioned, um, from the immersion process from the very beginning to the construction uh, of, the, of the school with the local uh, community. And uh, we, we've been able to challenge and uh, uh, understand different backgrounds from different uh, contexts. And the students came together and built this uh, nice, this dignifying school for um, uh, primary students. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's it's a beautiful project, and when the exhibition opens, I hope that everybody can come and see it. And thank you, Emily, showing a few images. These fantastic stone walls. Um, it's just really wonderful the way it sits in the landscape. Uh, there's the kind of the woven doors um, and these wonderful porches. Oh, it's great to see it. I <laughs> thank you so much for showing this. Um, so, and these were architecture students, right? Graduates of architecture programs. And I think as any one of us who has yeah. done any work with uh, design build, there's always some challenges and I, not to tell any stories out of school, so to speak, but I'm curious about the learning process for the fellows program itself about undertaking this design build task for this primary school. Do you have any, um, share any challenges or any surprises? in the task of doing that? I mean, obviously you needed a client who was ready to, um, who embraced this process. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the big challenge which ended up being an opportunity was that they, we have these 10 students from uh, eight different cultures. So they have a wide variety of uh, understanding of architecture from their context, but it became uh, um, uh, an opportunity for, for them to, uh, teach each other uh, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the the craftsmanship from the, uh, different backgrounds, and uh, as well as uh, analyzing the uh, as you can see in this uh, image, they've been able to to unlock the uh, the local crafts and uh, creatives that and are in Rwanda and um, uh, made them a reality through like uh, the design of the facade of the school and they. They expand that to to furniture and uh, uh, different like light fi fixtures and uh, uh, all aspects of the of the design have been a, a process of an understanding uh, what how can we translate the local uh, knowledge into something beautiful into a space. So yeah, it was a very good learning curve, and uh, we're very grateful that we've been able to get the 10 students together and we learned a lot from them. That's great. I'm sure they learned a lot from each other. It's also uh, wonderful to think about the kids, the children who are at the primary school and the stories about the building that they go to. Um, it's a little early for that kind of follow-up, but I'll be interested in Mass's next 10 years uh, to find out what kind of impact that uh, learning in an environment like that will have made on uh, the children that are at that school. I don't know if there is, that's, you guys talk about evaluation as inherent to your process. So I'm, I'm really interested in how you, how the firm stays in touch and keeps up with some of these. I don't know, Emily, if there are any plans to sort of do follow-ups on any of these um, primary schools to see the influence of a design build and that kind of narrative on the children that go there. Yeah, I mean, I think what's what's great about this project in particular, and then also I'll just show a few images of the um, Mabuga Primary School. Both of them are located um, outside of the Musanze district or within that area. And so um, we have team members visiting these schools every once in a while to one, see how the maintenance is is upkeeping over time? Is there anything that we can do to support or answer any questions about uh, the way the building does, was designed so that we can help them understand how to maintain it over time? Um, and so for both of these projects, I think we've actually, and Taylor may be able to speak to this 
better, but we have had frequent visitors or team members um, going back every once in a while, and we have existing relationships with um, the heads of the schools to be able to discuss how things are going. Um, I think in terms of an overall, you know, generally we like to do larger um, evaluation or impact reports, and that's something that we like to do, you know, a certain number of years after the project so that we've had it's had time to settle in and to grow into its own sort of bones and then be able to to come back and, and do that and so I think that's still under discussion for some of these projects yeah that's fascinating we're going to get into a little bit more uh, later about uh, mass build when we get to that but I want to talk a little bit more stay focused on this question of fabrication and craft and making because the story of the whole Butaro campus is itself kind of fascinating. And so uh, besides that campus, the district hospital, and then there's a series of housing projects and other things that were part of that, um, where else is this low fab uh, strategy? And are there places where you can point out sort of, I'm interested in the combination of different technologies of the sort of local fabrication, local materials, Teo talked about the four principles, but certainly in a hospital, there's places where there's completely different kind of technologies that are brought in. And so um, where aside from these, the Butaro project, have you been able to apply some of these methods? So I think, um, you know, we, we started this at Butaro, maybe I can give a little bit of background as to how it started here because it has in, in relation to the Butara District Hospital it has expanded within the overall campus itself. Mm -hmm. We've worked on other projects in, in this area. Um, and I think this approach on low fab or local fabrication, um, we've used this since the very beginning of our practice, which the idea behind it is really to the traditional way of constructing walls highlights cement as the statement of status and for Butaro we actually sought to challenge this value statement and to repurpose materials that are often overlooked and underutilized and explore some other creative ways to construct using what's available locally so really this idea of bringing value to the communities we work with um, and and I think this was really focused on developing this good material palette for Butara District Hospital, which has expanded to other projects and other work across the globe. Um, you know, I think one example is also uh, ways that we have used this on um, places like Elima in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is one of the kind of most remote areas in the world where we used mud and dirt and wood around us to really construct a center that would show us ways to protect and conserve our rich biodiversity. Um, another example was really in, Al in Alabama, the um, Equal Justice Initiative Memorial um, to, pe uh, to Peace and Justice was really looking at ways to repurpose wood reclaimed um, from old cotton mills for concrete formwork and in, in Texas for local brick manufacturers in a healthcare facility. And so we've expanded that um, original thinking and that original process to other projects across the globe, but really started and took root in uh, the work that we did in Butaro. And I think what's exciting is, you know, you mentioned Anne Marie at the very beginning of this conversation is that we've been able to see this um, desire and passion to continue to drive that craft and that understanding of how you can work with the local volcanic stones specific in this region um, to improve it over the years. And uh, we often like to kind of, sorry, I'm gonna expand the advance to some photos here, but to show some of the uh, Mason cooperatives and head Lee Mason's um, one example being Hakisa, uh, who works on the Butara District Hospital and has really been able to expand his Mason cooperative and his work um, beyond work with Mass, but to other clients um, within the region or within Kigali, the capital of uh, Rwanda. 
um, and is even showing up here in we transfer download websites, which is, you know, of course, is, is really just um, for us a, a really great testament to the um, value and dignity that can occur within this type of work. Um, and then from Kwanzi, which is, uh, sorry, this is a screenshot from a video that we had produced of her, um, who is this amazing head female Mason, um, who was leading a lot of the work in Mutaro and stayed with us through the district hospital to the doctor's housing projects that we have nearby, as well as the shareholder housing project. And we can talk a little bit further as well as to how she's continued to work with us um, on the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund campus and, and mentor and train individuals um, to learn from her experience. So I hope that, sorry, I went a lot, bit on a tangent, but I hope that kind of answers your question about how we've used it, but also where it kind of came from and what's embedded in this process. Yeah, I think it's really interesting in the, the Ilima project, which as you described is an extremely remote site. And so the idea of it's local by necessity, because the how would you get any materials there? I've looked at some of those images and basically there's a level of resourcefulness that is really thinking about what's at hand and what we can make. I'm really intrigued about uh, how that is translatable to sites and projects in the US, in a sense, how we, we can make a choice to use local craft and to develop um, a local competencies and also local materials. We sometimes think that that's a necessity, but we can also make that choice in the global north in addition to in all these other projects. So that's really wonderful to expand that. And I think to get to this question about why that's important, maybe Teo, you want to pick up that thread because you, you touched on those four principles um, of, you know, of the craft. And I'm interested in why, the, why is it so important to uh, mass design? Why is it so important in general to value craftsmanship and to think about a local fabrication? Are there environmental benefits to this? Does this help in other ways? Um, there's the, the people, but there's also the place. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything to thinking about the, the other benefits, the impacts of this kind of focus. Yeah, I mean, the um, it's, it's not only about what we have on the ground, but also uh, we realized that creating a sense of ownership in the communities and uh, these projects come into the communities that, and uh, who are, most of the time they consider them uh, as like they're being chased out of the, uh, the, their farmlands or like the, 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 their day life. And uh, we, it's, it's important to, to, to value um, uh, the communities you, 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 you're working with and uh, create a sense of ownership as uh, we realize that it, it helps the project in terms of uh, 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 maintenance and uh, mm -hmm. as well as uh, transferring the, the, the learnings from the projects into their, 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 their uh, uh, construction uh, on their houses. Uh, so it's, uh, it's our, um, responsibility to, to value the, the local knowledge and upskill um, uh, the, the, the local communities so that they can uh, uh, come from point A to point B. We have so many cases or examples of people who, are, who have developed, um, uh, who have um, economically developed and uh, skill-wise skill have been able to, to reach uh, higher levels uh, because of projects. Um, yeah, Hakiza is one example, but we have so many other examples, and um, yeah. Yeah, so it isn't just the impact of, that the building makes is filling a need, but the building continues to have impacts as the people who take ownership of it, the people who learned how to build it, and then they take those skills into other projects. Yes. So it sounds, you know, like this was kind of grew up with mass, like as mass began to work in Africa in the Butaro District Hospital and this idea of low fab, local fabrication. And now there's a full-blown entity called Mass Build, which I'm really intrigued about. And I was looking at the, the diagram of how this is different, like it's a mission-driven contractor, which is not usually a phrase we're accustomed to hearing in the design and construction field. So 
Uh, this new initiative, I think, is, is fascinating to me, so I hope we can talk a little bit more in detail. Um, and Emily, maybe I'm going to throw it to you first, talking about um, the Ellen DeGeneres campus for the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund. That's a long name for this fascinating project. And I think uh, certainly conservation is a major issue, but this is, is Mass Build is involved in this project. And so maybe this is a way to talk about that and to talk about what differentiates Mass Build from a typical contractor, because it would have to be different as part of Mass. Yeah, I'm happy. To, I'm happy to speak to that briefly, and I think Teo, you know, as a part of the build team, is also really well suited to to answer that. But I think um, this really stemmed from our partnership with the Fossey Fund as well, and in first and foremost, really wanting to have maximum impact on this project. Um, there was a real, and still is a real alignment. Um, with this project in particular, among you know there are others as well, but this desire to really continue the investment mm -hmm. in the communities that they are serving as well, and and um, Fossey Fund has been in Rwanda for over 50 years and been leading the charge on conservation efforts, and um, you know they have taught us a lot about their expertise in community engagement and this process to educate others, um, not only on the importance of conservation efforts, um, but also to keep them informed along the way about what is happening. And, um, and so this, the pro this project, the Ellen DeGeneres Campus of the Diane Fossey Gorilla Fund um, has been the beginning of that partnership of um, this mission-driven um, construction arm. And, um, I think has allowed, uh, has given this ability to increase uh, the impact of the project over time by having um, control over certain elements of the construction process of how we're hiring, who, who we're hiring, and ensuring that um, there is transparency in that process, as well as then being able to um, work with the Fossey Fund to develop education sessions and hold surveys and understand along the way um, their sort of understanding of why this campus will exist, also who Fossey Fund is and conservation of gorillas and the importance that that really has to the ecosystem um, and to the environment that they live in. And so the, the long answer is uh, about um, this partnership is I think a really exciting one. And you know, this, this campus is under construction. Of course, I'll let Teo talk more to, to build as an entity and, and where we're headed, but um, I think really exciting to, to have that alignment and be able to kind of see that impact come to fruition over the course of the construction. Great, yeah, so Teo, you are a part of the, the build team. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, your role? And again, I, I am still interested in this mission-driven contractor question and how Mass's values of dignity and justice shape a contracting practice and sort of how this came about. So yeah, this idea of uh, uh, creating a construction arm um, came about to, um, I think two years ago uh, by the, uh, the idea was to, 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 to create or give a full service, full spectrum of service of a, uh, um, uh, to, to our clients so that they get the value of their money uh, as well as uh, 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 the, the projects reach the impact that we, we, we said at the very beginning. Uh, so uh, Fossi Fund is our first project. I'm, uh, I'm part of the, the Quiet Assurance team. I'm uh, uh, one of the architects on the project. So um, based on site now and uh, we have a large uh, team that ranges from the um, uh, the designers and uh, builders and uh, uh, operations. Uh, we are about, uh, uh, on this project, we are about 35 uh, management staff. And uh, the other thing we, 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 we care about is gender balance in, uh, in, in, in the construction industry, like, um, uh, bringing more uh, uh, women leadership positions in the in, in a male dominated uh, profession. Which, which is something we value much. And um, another aspect of this uh, or idea of this mass build is that we will be able to influence uh, the construction sector in, 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 in Rwanda uh, uh, and, and uh, uh, in the region 
so that uh, the, the 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 other people who are doing the same profession can learn from us what what kind of value should we give our clients and uh, uh, how much a project can do uh, to the community to the gender and uh, um, what quality of life uh, should we aim for in, in our execution of the pro of projects. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think on the description of mass build, it says like architecture, construction is never neutral. And that <clears throat> construction either hurts or, <coughs> or heals. And it, maybe you expand a little bit more on the, the five E's that are uh, in the description of environment, education, equity, economy, and emotion. Sometimes in a typical project, certainly in the global north, economy is that first one. And ideally also environment is part of it. Um, and equity, education, I, I would rarely see emotion listed on a, a hierarchy of uh, goals for construction projects. So I'm interested in that set of the five E's and um, how that how that figures into how and the impact of uh, how build is working. I'm also just to add to the question that I'm provoking for you, Teo, to answer, and then Emily can add in. Is the goal also that build will uh, do work for other architects, or is it seen as always uh, working with um, mass design? Um, yeah, it's. Um, I mean, I will let Emily explain more about the five E's, but the. Um, uh, to the point of working with the other architects, we, we started this to for uh, initially was uh, for to, to be able to implement our project to the best quality we want, but um, we'll be open to to implementing other uh, works that are mission aligned with mass mm -hmm. because we want this to be a, a systemic change in the industry. So we won't we won't keep it to ourselves. That's great. Don't keep it to yourself. Uh, at this point, I do want to make sure the audience knows that they can share some questions in the um, question section of the little dashboard thing or the uh, dialogue box. Um, I would be happy to entertain any questions people have. Uh, we are, it's so much to talk about, we're quickly running out of time. So I want to make sure if someone has a question, go ahead and type fast uh, and you can send it and we will try to answer it. Because I'm also interested, obviously, in the future. Uh, I think it was 2008 to 2018, first 10 years, and um, the exhibition is sort of commemorating that a little bit later, but we'll just consider 2020 a do-over uh, for so many reasons. Um, and so when, when we open the exhibition, Mass will be well into its, or at least at the beginning of its second decade as a practice. And it's obviously, um, expanded, diversified, um, the work has increased in complexity uh, and also impact. And this past year, 2020, has certainly shined a bright light on many of the firm's primary issues, like Kathy said in her introduction, the issues of just individual health, planetary health, uh, public health, justice, equity. So thinking ahead a bit, um, you've each been with Mass for a few years. Um, any thoughts on the next 10 years? Uh, is, there, is there work that you feel like um, you haven't gotten a chance to do yet? Is there something that coming out of 2020 in terms of design, construction, or research, we haven't talked as much about Mass's uh, research work, um, that you feel like is risen to the top of the concerns for the, for the firm right now? Um, Emily, I don't know if you want to jump in on that. Yeah, of course. Be happy to to start with my response. I think I mean I think it's a really, really great question. And um, you know, simply in in some cases, this is really what has brought me to Mass and why you know I'm continuously inspired to work here because I think our future work will always be focused on continuing to address injustices around the world. And I think what we've seen over the past 10 years is that we have been able to grow into different topic areas or um, bring our expertise to some of these conversations um, just from the start of really where 
the genesis of what we were born on, which is this idea and this awareness of how spaces should be safe um, for everyone and should be inclusive. Um, and so I know this may not sound like a full answer, but I think, you know, what we are, we tend to really just expand our reach um, and hope to really focus on any issues to address those injustices. And so our partnerships can span from, um, you know, working with native communities in the United States to food insecurity and how can we address an entire ecosystem understanding how um, intertwined and interconnected we are. Um, and I think that the global pandemic has really put a spotlight on that as an issue. And it's it's really highlights the levels of injustices. And so being able to design for spaces that can speak to those full ecosystems that can design for resilience and also just focus on safe spaces that can heal. Um, and so I know that might sound like a non-answer, but it's really because it's really focused on the, um, you know, where we started and, and our, our, our values um, and our kind of design collective and mission driven uh, visions. Interesting, Teo, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the only thing I will add to that would be, part of uh, the, uh, the the mass build uh, um, assignment to influence uh, the construction industry and what are what are the construction standards should we set uh, uh, in uh, uh, should we influence uh, in, in the in the profession how can we change uh, health and safety um, uh, standards in uh, in the construction industry uh, making sure that clients are aware of that and uh, they, they they know what they deserve and the quality of design they they they, they, they deserve for their money yeah. thank you it looks like uh dr glass do you have a do you have a question for emily or teo no not not as much a question but i do um i i do want to um emphasize just uh what a what a um revolution, I think, in uh, design that, that Mass is, is introducing. And it's so, in the history of architecture, I don't know that there are many uh, comparables. Uh, maybe the question is, was can you talk about um, any models that you have out there in terms of the practice that you have now? And I do have some closing comments, but I do want to just ask that question. What is the precedent for something like this? I think that the aim has always been to disrupt that precedent and to be a model of, of practice that um, is serving society. That's kind of um, what MAP stands for, Model of Architecture Serving Society. And I think the reason we started was to be able to say that we can operate in this nonprofit realm um, and do this with a purpose and do this with a mission. And so um, I think we have it's hard to point to other models that are similar um in a way we're going to be very uh, honored to uh feature your work um next year when the museum reopens and then the first major exhibition we have is of mass design um i don't know susan if you have any other questions but i did want to mention a couple of our sponsors if i could I will um, actually, I will let you uh, wind it up. I'll just save my final thank yous until after you have. Uh, thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure we, we recognized our significant sponsors, CoStar, uh, the Candida found, uh, Fund, and also Every Town for Gun Safety. Okay. So thank you to our sponsors and also to the uh, in International uh, Masonry Institute. Yeah, wonderful. This has been absolutely fascinating. And I think um, on the one hand, it's hard to find precedents for this kind of practice. And uh, there may have been, but they might not have been able to keep this, keep the model going, which is, I think, one of the really significant contributions that mass design has shown is that, yes, you can set up a practice that's quite different. And that's why I'm so fascinated in uh, mass build is to see how that um, 
how that actually works because what's important is, is certainly in my students and I think in younger architects, we're seeing a lot of interest in forging different kinds of practices and using design and construction, whether it's local or high tech, um, as instruments for actually making uh, the world better. And I'm happy that the National Building Museum gets to amplify those stories, which is what we get to do. Um, so I want to thank um, I want to thank both of you, Emily and Teo, for again staying up late, spending your evening with us, uh, and I want to thank MASP in general for uh, their generosity um, in terms of just their spirit of design and building. I find it every time I I'm involved in a MASP program, I come away more inspired than before. I also want to thank International Masonry Institute once again and the National Building Museum and thank our audience. We have quite a few attendees. Um, I assume that they've just been wrapped in attention listening to this and I hope that we'll see some of them uh, in person when we get to reopen. I'm looking forward to it and also inspired by uh, how design, uh, the fact that architecture can do so much more than it has been doing. So with that, I'm seeing no other questions. Uh, again, I want to thank all of you, and I will unceremoniously click the <laughs> click the X that's going to end the meeting for all, uh, unless Emily or Teo, you had any last comments. No, I just wanted to say thank you so much. We are honored to to be here with you all tonight and to partner together and um, really. Appreciate this discussion and um, look forward to the next one. Thanks so much for, for all of your support and your time. Wonderful. Okay. Same here. It was a pleasure being uh, part of this conversation. Wonderful. I look forward to many more. Everybody, stay well. Bye-bye.